A quick content warning. This episode contains references to suicide. If you or someone you know may be struggling with thoughts of suicide, you can call or text 988 or visit 988.ca. In cases of an emergency, call 911. Please take care when listening. Failure is like a beautiful thing because the harder you fail, the less likely you are to do it again. I went to Russia and I signed the biggest pro contract I'd ever signed, broke my hand, and then I was like, oh my God, what's going on? I felt sad like often. I just lost control of my subconscious. One of my favorite quotes is, outwork your self-doubt. You earn the right to be confident through the actions that you commit each day. I think it's really cool for the young kids coming up who like hockey and also like other things. Being able to show that you can do both, it's to try to make life more open for athletes. There's this notion that you need a lot to be able to help and that's not true. You need thought and if you're thoughtful, you will be able to help them. We're excited to share another episode of the Talk Today podcast. I'm Alex Salome. And I'm Justin Dickey. On this episode, we're speaking with pro hockey player, rapper, and entrepreneur, Josh Hosang. Known for his creative playing style and exceptional stick handling skills, he has gained attention for both his on-ice talent and his outspoken personality. Josh was selected by the New York Islanders in the first round of the 2014 NHL Draft. Now, in his eighth season as a pro, his career has included 53 games with the Islanders. This is a really great episode because despite the challenges he has faced throughout his life, Josh opens up about his personal growth and mental health journey. He talks about the ups and downs in his career and his most recent ventures into music and app development. But before we start this episode, the best way to support this podcast is to like, comment, and share with a friend. Josh Ho Sang, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Uh, joining us from uh, sunny Florida today, I take it. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. I might have, might have took a peek at the weather there before we jumped on. It's a little warmer <laughs> than it is here today. We're six degrees in Nova Scotia. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I got to go to the rink today and sit, sit in the sun for a bit rack up the vitamin D and then take a very well-deserved nap after a, a three and three. So <laughs> yeah, for sure. And uh, yeah, so I take it you're, you know, you're enjoying Florida so far based on that. Yeah. Florida has been amazing, but uh, more so than the weather, it's been like the environment that the Everblades have created. Um, I have so much credit for Ralphie and for Brushy and for PD, like the staff, uh, <laughs> Boof, Johnny, Sarah, like the things that they do for us um, on a day to day basis and um, the care that they put into not only creating like, this home environment for the players, but also for the fans who come. Um, the mentality that they try to instill in their players is so rooted in like education and kindness. And um, I think a lot of that comes from probably the Florida Panthers organization. I know that Paul Maurice has always been, uh, always tried to be a teacher. And it seems like he's like got better and better at that over his tenure um, as a coach. And it seems like uh, that's a focal point through this organization obviously don't know too much but uh from my experience here it's been it's been fantastic that sounds amazing so far and uh on that um you know you've had a a a big few weeks here so um let's get into it um first question i had for you was between releasing releasing a rap album launching a mobile app and returning to hockey it's been a big few weeks um, in full disclosure, when that all dropped the same day, I was like, this guy, he's an animal. What's going on here? He's doing all the things. Uh, did you intend for all of this to come together all at once? I did. I did. <laughs> yeah. He, um, I, when I made my platform, I knew that awareness was a big thing. Like, uh, when you initiate any business or, you want to make any change 
uh, whatsoever, it's important for you to have like uh, a goal. <laughs> and then uh, once you meet it, then figure out what's the best way to express it. And for me, uh, just with, I guess, my uh, rocky public history, <laughs> um, I felt that it would be nice nice opportunity to share a little bit about myself and my story, um, maybe attempt to set the record straight on how I feel about it. Um, my goal is never to necessarily tell my side of the story. It was just to honestly thank, I guess, some of the harder times that I had publicly. Um, and acknowledge to people that um, I don't consider myself a failure by any means. And um, to acknowledge to myself that I don't consider myself a failure by any means. And um, one of my favorite quotes is by Alex Hermosi. And his quote is, Outwork your self doubt. It says confidence is creative and uh, you earn the right to be confident through the actions that you commit each day. And so I feel like it's such a powerful sentiment because um, when you are doing the right things and you are following your heart and your passion and you're putting in hours and hours and hours, it does get to the point where you start to feel this sense of self and this sense of strength through repetition. And yes, there's a lot of other stuff that comes with that, <laughs> but I do think that the core value of it is is very unique i had never heard anyone um i guess pose breaking out through the noise uh quite so simply <laughs> and so that that quote always was always special to me uh since the day i heard it and i heard it i'm gonna say he said it almost like three years ago and it's caught a little bit of traction since then but yeah and for me it was like a a sort of background noise that I had, like when I broke my hand and when I was writing my music and creating my app, a lot of that was like, work through your self-doubt. And then I was excited to kind of show everything together when it was done because um, throughout my career, I had been called lazy and I had been called um a bad teammate and um, I had been called uh, stupid and a problem child. And so to be able to like sit back, work with people in the real world um, and like outside of professional sports <laughs> and uh, have those uh, interactions go so well and all these people uh, compliment me on my work rate and uh, how easy I am to work with it like reinstilled this belief that um, that I can do all these things that maybe even at times that I doubted but uh, through hard work <laughs> and repetition uh, I proved it to myself and then uh, if other people see it that's lovely but if not that's okay because I proved it to myself. <laughs> That's awesome. What a message. What a, what a way to start this off. Um, I want to get into a little bit maybe about that, that, uh, that public sentiment that you touched on later. Um, but first, let's get into, um, you know, the, the new exciting stuff you have on the go. So um, first of all, your, your, your debut album, Same, um, obviously dropped a few weeks ago. What went into that album? The writing process, recording, artwork, promotion. How much work went into all of that and over like what period of time? Because maybe this was out there, but like I, this was dropped a few weeks ago and I was like, Josh Hosang, the hockey player, dropped a rap album. Like 
this kind of come out of nowhere and an app in the same day. Like um, how, so what went into all of that? How have you felt about it, the response to it? And lastly, are you, you know, hoping to start performing live at some point or is this more of an artistic endeavor? It's a big question. Um, <laughs> maybe, I'll, maybe too much all at once, but let's, let's piece uh, that out. Let's talk about the process first. Uh, the process. So, um, my producer, Gregory Grimes, um, during my, like when my hand was still kind of messed up, I got introduced to Gregory and, um, I like lost my outlet, you know, like music was my space to find out more about me, like for a few years, um, probably between like 23 and like 26. I just used writing as like an exercise for like my mental health. Um, but then when I broke my hand, I couldn't really work out in the same way. Um, I get that like feeling of relief almost. Um, and I couldn't really um, skate and play hockey the way that I loved, like that made me more sad, like being on the ice skating with one hand. Um, <laughs> and so uh, it was really, really special when I met Gregory because he offered me this space of uh, education. Uh, he showed me some of, I guess like the musical limits. <laughs> And he took the time to explain uh, sound and how he sees sound. And through that, we created like a really cool relationship. And then I started writing music and then it just like, just bang, 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 bang. And um, when it was all said and done, I was just really proud of the message. I'm. I do think from a music standpoint, it's very intriguing because I have, I only have intention of spreading um, thoughtfulness. Uh, and so the moment that I feel like I'm not doing that, I'll probably stop music um, because I think that um, music is one of the most impactful, if not the most impactful thing in the world. Um, it's like an offered subconscious, I guess. Um, and so you have to be very careful, like what you're allowing into your subconscious. <laughs> um, so for me, I take that very seriously and I respect the craft. And, um, so yeah, when I, when I kind of put that together and I felt like it was, um, powerful and truthful and um i i decided that it was kind of ready for for people to hear um i wanted to offer um music offers me silence at times when my mind's really loud and i wanted to offer that silence back to others and um i wanted to on the slight chance that i could make a song that you know could offer someone peace for three minutes it's worth the embarrassment of potentially you know hundreds of thousand people not liking it because the one person that it does help um that impact goes so much further than myself or others will ever realize and so i think that's why it's important to put out music if you do feel that like inkling of <laughs> um a message. Um, one song that I actually think of a lot when I think about music is um, Over the Rainbow. Uh, somewhere over the rainbow. Then, then. It's like a Hawaiian uh, song. And the man who made that, he came in, uh, had like no money uh, from what I recall. I'm paraphrasing this story, but he didn't have a lot of money and he came into the studio and he said, I have this song and it's like in me and I just need to get it out of me. And 
the producer is like, okay, like it'll be the, 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 and he said, you know, I don't have much. And he's like, is it possible for me to like just record it as quickly as possible? And the guy's like, sure, you know, and I don't know if many people know about this guy, but he's like a heavier set man. And, um, you know, I, I would have judged, um, you know, what he was going to come with uh in the studio if i was the producer and i'm like what am i about to get right now like it could be uh a very very wide range and uh the producer says he came in and he recorded it in 20 minutes and i feel like that 20 minutes that courage that he showed through that period uh to be able to like ask for help and um to be able to want to spread this message then like transcended through a lot of the us and in canada and still today we hear that song and um i feel like it elicits such beautiful emotions and that man i'm pretty sure passed away not too long after he released that song and and i think that um that that was a big inspiration for me um in terms of like doing it because a life is short and b um when the sentiment is is pure it's um it's hard to go wrong yeah and so you mentioned you know the potential for embarrassment putting yourself out there to the world but the potential to help someone in the process is all worth it how have you felt the response has been to this so far as you know did you have expectations and uh, what's the what's the response been i tried i tried my best to remove expectations to tell you that i didn't have expectations for this would be a complete and utter lie Uh, no for me my expectation was like maybe you know like 5,000 people like checking out my music and then um, being able to, I guess, interact with some of those people who like listen to it. And um, the response was even crazier than that. And um, I think I'm at like over 100,000 plays on Spotify alone. Um, So that blew my mind uh that like there's people outside of hockey who are like listening to my music and probably have no idea i play hockey and to me that's so beautiful because i think that that's life you know like you meet people you hear something and you have no idea like what's really going on with that particular person but um it's an ability it's it's the ability to connect with uh with the public and also I think it's really cool for the young kids coming up who um, like hockey um, and also like other things. I think that being able to show that you can do both. I mean, uh, I launched both those things, uh, but I also knew that I had to come in and do work because on the ice, (laughs) Because if I launched both those things and then I wasn't a very good hockey player, then it would just reinforce that people can't do both. And so I've been really proud with my performance with the Everblades um, and uh, just like how I've been able to like manage both. Uh, so, yeah, it's a it's a lot. But for me, um, it's to try to make life um more open for athletes and to also offer perspective um, to fans and to anyone who's really going through anything. Um, I think that uh, a lot of times we punish ourselves with self-isolation. But one thing we don't tend to do through that process is stop listening to music. And so... um, I thought it was like a great space to try to say, Hey, it's not so bad (laughs) and things will get better. Love it. Are you, uh, so I I touched on this initially in the question before I rambled on with seven different questions at once. Um, Is this, was this more of just an, uh, 
are like an artful expression endeavor like you just wanted to get something out there or do you want to venture into doing this like live performances i would do live performances i do live performances every week i play hockey <laughs> uh for me like uh performing in front of people is my passion i think that that's something that kind of got lost and is kind of in professional sports is that the game is meant to entertain it's meant to be beautiful uh it's not you know people fell in love with sports because of the chaos not because of the structure and i try to <laughs> I tried to offer uh, beauty and controlled chaos for the other team. <laughs> and um, for me, uh, playing hockey is another expression of my art. I think if you talk to a lot of um, GMs and uh, coaches that have interacted with me, that they'll say that he's more of an artist than a hockey player. Uh, and I just see the game in a beautiful way. Um, and I try my best to, to help people perceive it that way. Awesome. We got lots more to delve into on, on that stuff uh, later on. Um, I do want to shift gears briefly to touch on the other things you have on the go. Uh, tell us about your app, uh, Pub Sports, and what was the inspiration and what went into the development and how's the reception of that been? That's been awesome. Um, I think to, I guess, give people like a quick run through. Uh, the app is basically a platform that you can download, you can host or join games and you get rewarded for being active with others. So it's about encouraging you to reach out to your friends and your community and schedule workouts, runs, bike rides, skateboarding, swimming, um, running, hockey, basketball. We got tons and tons of sports uh, for you to be able to enter into and create a community. Um, I felt like that was important because I felt like it was something we were missing in society. And for me, um, you make this environment you want to live in. Um, and I felt like even if I don't do it perfect, that it will push the thought forward in society and that if my platform doesn't become the most successful, that someone will come forward and, um, either want to work with us <laughs> or, um, push uh, a similar MO. And my biggest goal is to get people away from their PCs and their PlayStations for seven hours of the day. You know, like we can cut that down to like two um, and do things for themselves physically. I think that mm, over the last like couple decades, the um, ideology around physical health and pain has been like really separated. So like people um, have issues with their backs and they have issues with their knees and their hips. And a lot of that comes from just lack of use. Um, lotion is lotion. And if you don't use it, you lose it. Those are quotes for a reason. And so I think that a lot of the suffering that people go through physically as they get older comes from the their lack of willingness to suffer or to like exert themselves um, continuously, like through that transition. Um, there's no human being on this planet that was made to sit down. Like that's not what we we're designed to do. Um, and yes, I understand like with society that's very prominent in like what our day to day, but that's not what we we're made for. And so I think that if you want to feel good doing that stuff, it's important to uh, get out. And um, also it's important to do your best to create uh, communities and relationships that encourage you to do that on days where it may be a little bit harder. 
For sure. And like, like I said, going back to that kind of announcement, you got an app, you've got a, you've got your rap album. I'm not a rap fan per se, but I, you know, I looked up your music, listened to the album and throughout it, I was kind of like, you know, kind of into it. And I was like, this is actually really good. The, I, the app concept, I'm like, this is brilliant. I'm surprised it hasn't been done. Like, so, you know, and then on top of it all, this guy is a pro hockey player. Um, and, you know, you've been out of the game for a year. You, you had your injury and you, you just recently signed with ECHL Florida. So, um, you know, how's the return to play going and how did that kind of scenario come to be? So I've played less than, less than 90 hockey games in four years. Um, because of the pandemic. And then I had the one, uh, there's the pandemic and I only played, I think eight games that year. And then played with Toronto. I played like 70 something. And then I played with Russia and I played like eight games again and I got hurt. And then I didn't play most of this year. So it's been more than a year really for me. Um, and uh it's so lovely i mean the pandemic year um that was a little bit um hmm. that was like business related like the islanders were restricting my movement uh and my choices so i didn't have any uh say in that really um, people don't understand, but like when you're off your entry level contract, you can't just leave. Like they still have your rights. Uh, so I was stuck and obviously things didn't go well. And, um, uh, pro sports is, um, hmm. merciless to a degree. Uh, they rather no one have me <laughs> than, uh, not get the value that they deem is acceptable. And it was like catch 22 because the Islanders viewed me as like this very, very prominent prospect. And so they wanted a return, which is fair. They invested in me and um, they made their choices. And unfortunately I got the, the shit and the stick in terms of not really being able to play and not being put in the best situations like for me on my development. And then in Toronto, I had a really, really cool experience. That was awesome. I got to play in the Olympics. Uh, I felt like my hockey was kind of like getting back on track. And then I went to Russia and I signed the biggest pro contract I'd ever signed. Broke my hand. <laughs> and then I was like, oh, my God, what's going on? Uh, I'm, you know, 20, 26 at the time. And... Um, you know, I have a shattered, <laughs> a shattered wrist and um, just trying to figure out kind of how I got there. And <laughs> um, and so it was really cool, like finding my way back because I, I didn't think I was going to play hockey again at that time. Um, for me, going back to my artist statement is like, if I can't make art the way that I see it, then I'd rather um, teach it or or step away from it and um fortunately enough with the help from matt nickel who i will proclaim is the greatest trainer on the planet but <laughs> um i'm sure people honestly don't really think many would debate it but <laughs> everyone debates everything these days um but with maddie um he his environment um, in in Toronto, Downsview Park, if anyone wants to go bother him. Uh, <laughs> he, uh, he creates such a beautiful environment for healing. And when I came back, I was, I was broken in many, many ways. And um, his team there, Andre, Ryan, Mel, uh, Mike, Mikey, <laughs> uh, a lot of the people, Rebecca, 
yeah, Sam, Kat, they're all just like, they're all amazing. Um, and those are the people who I spent the majority of my time with when I was doing my rehab. Um, there's even more staff members there and they know that I love them. Um, but for me, yeah, that's kind of how I got back here and how I was able to do those things that not a lot of people know, but I think Matt Nickel is one of just the most incredible men on, on the planet. He's, he's such a, he's such a great father figure. He is such a great leader. Um, what Matt has been able to do with his career has constantly come from people, you know, not quite being where he is. <laughs> and he just pushes through it. And he was the, he was the head trainer at the Leafs. And I'm not going to botch Matty's story. I'm sure you can dive into it. But things, you know, weren't 100% the way that Matty saw it. And he kind of stepped away. Then this guy made BioSteel, which is like now one of the biggest drinks in the world. And he created this gym that was producing the best athletes in the world uh, and our hockey players and basketball players. And then he made this gym even bigger. And now he's like the head director of, of at, uh, the Ottawa Senators and the Hamilton Bulldogs and the Hamilton Ticat. Like, this guy is all time. He's all time. And, um, I guess my admiration for him and the conversations that we had encouraged me that, um, I could break through some of this stuff that I was going through and that I could still create and offer, um, substance to my life and, and to others. I want, I'll let Alex ask a question here at some point, but I want to piggyback on what you mentioned there about you weren't sure if you were going to play hockey again. Can you take us back to that? Th you know, things were kind of rough. You, you injured yourself in, in Russia. And then did, did you think you were done at that point? And then what, at what point did you decide you were going to try again? Uh, yeah, I thought I was done to be honest. Um, I, I knew that I wasn't going to stop working on my hand until my hand got better. It was such a weird, weird dynamic. I knew I wasn't going to stop working on my hand until I got better. Uh, until I could like use it like really, really well in my day to day. And I knew that if I got to that point that I would want to play hockey, but hockey wasn't like the focus, like, um, it was just more like being able to like, you know, hug my mother <laughs> and, uh, being able to like dap up my voice, <laughs> like, this is my right hand. So, yeah. Uh, that was like, you know, the start. Um, yeah, I guess I, when I came back, I played four games, four playoff games, I think for UFA, three or four. And at the time, like they knew, like I had a noodle, <laughs> like I, my hand like didn't really work and but they had done so much for me that I was willing to risk my longevity and um, basically my hand for them because of the kindness that they had shown me. And uh, so I played. And um, after that, I had like four or five breakaways, couldn't shoot on any of them, a couple chances. Um, I made a lot of plays. Um, through that series, but it just like, it was just a little bit off. And to me that, I guess that was enough, like for me personally to be like, if I can't bring forward my best, then I don't, I don't know if I want to do this. And um, no, it just sent me back on my journey to go train and, and feel good. And then um, when all the pro guys left and, and I couldn't play three on three anymore <laughs> and like have fun, um, 
I took my time to continue to rehab. And then I would say like around October, I started to, uh, I, I guess I started to realize that hockey is something that I love. Um, and that if I can't play it at the rate that I did, that I would still want to play because I shouldn't take play away from myself. And, and so I started playing in the men's leagues in Toronto. And for anyone who like lives in Toronto knows the Toronto men's leagues are no joke. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, I was playing against some like good competition, X pros. Um, and I was just having fun again. And these guys were like so happy to see me. They didn't care what time I showed up. Like <laughs> there's no pressure. Everyone was like, give Josh the fuck, keep Josh on the ice. <laughs> and um, you know, they they kept bugging me whenever I'd score a nice goal or make a nice play. They're like, dude, like come on. I, I would have refs in the different leagues who would like see me going from like whatever, York University to Westwood, and they're like, man, like, you love the game, like, just just don't stop thinking about it, right? And so, yeah, I guess through my work and, like, continuing to play, those guys kept me in decent shape because I've come back and <laughs> I've been able to do quite well. But, yeah, no, I was, like, working out probably a couple of days a week and, playing men's league like twice a week and I was like I'm basically living a pro like, like schedule uh let's see if I can go help the Everglades make history and yeah uh yeah <laughs> happen. love it that's awesome that's a great message um yeah and I think you know um You've 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 talked a lot about the self reflection and um, and your music your music makes a lot of references to your mental health and and, and a lot of the things you've gone through. Um, I guess one thing we were kind of thinking is what what inspired you to do this in such an open way because you're talking about uh, you've you've already kind of talked about a lot of the challenges you've experienced. You've talked about your the, the important role that music has played in your mental health. Uh, so what has kind of helped you in challenge in channeling sort of, sort of all this energy into that and, and what kind of advice would you give to others who might, who might look at, uh, at, at ways to sort of support their mental health and finding those kind of tools? Hmm. Uh, the first thing that I would say to attempt <laughs> is to, um, focus on your self-talk and become your biggest fan. It will start off as tedious, um, but it really, really is one of the most healing things that you can offer yourself. Uh, we don't realize how negative our subconscious is just through um, media and constant comparison alone. Uh, those are destructive, and then you add like TV shows, music, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there's a lot of noise. And so just circling back and making sure that like the voices in your head and the, um, I guess the ambitions are like true to you. That would be like the, the first thing that I would kind of probably fixate on. And um, I think for the second, it's to focus on the one. Um, I think we get very, very clouded about trying to have this massive impact immediately. So, like, there's people who, like, aspire to be TikTok stars for, like, 15 minutes. And, like, they make a TikTok and they post it and it doesn't get 30 likes and they're, like... I'm done. My TikTok career is over. Um, I feel like we have a very all or nothing mentality as a society. And that's just detrimental to you and to, to the development of, of uh, <laughs> thinking, I think. Um, 
for me, the reason why I say focus on the one is because your interactions uh, should be focused on <laughs> um, the the individual. Uh, it should be focused on what you are trying to offer to one person. Um, I think from that space you can uh, create a lot of a lot of wonderful things. Um, for me, the possibility of helping someone find a friend to work out with <laughs> was just like so exciting. Like it's worth, you can't put a price on that for me. Um, the thought of um, someone being alone, you know, and turning on one of my songs and not feeling as alone. Like you can't put a price on that for me. Um, and I guess a lot of that comes from like my personal experiences, but more so, like I said to you guys, you create the world that you, you want to live in. And I used to see things and complain about them like all of us do and we don't realize but it's like when you talk about what you wish the government would do or what you wish your boss would do or what you wish your work would do you're complaining and i think that offering action um and focusing on the fact that like you're just trying to change it for the one, whether it's you, whether it's your friend, whether it's someone you love, or just all the people in the world. Uh, pick one, <laughs> one person you want to focus on on this planet, and um, and then build stuff from there. I think that uh, that's a great way to create and to allow yourself to be gentle. Um, I can tell people from experience that having over a million eyes judge you is not that exciting. <laughs> uh, so anyone who aspires to that, be careful what you wish for. <laughs> um, but in the same sentiment, um, there's this notion that you need a lot to be able to help. And that's not true. You, you need you need thought. And if you're thoughtful, you'll be able to help me. I want to get back to the, the music in a moment, but I wanted to touch on something you said there about you used to complain. And all I've heard since we started this conversation is a very thoughtful person, very open minded person. What changed and when did that change? Mm. I used to think everyone was, I used to think there was a time in my life, a time in my life, not my whole life, but I used to think there was a time in my life where everyone was against me. And then I decided that that didn't matter. I think that like, it's such a funny, I laugh at myself now. I mean, when I was in the moment, I totally get it. But no, I just, I think it's amusing that, um, you know, when you think everyone's against you, like, if they are, <laughs> then you need to work harder. Then <laughs> you need to find a way to offer yourself a space of happiness and um, also be able to create the environment to be successful. And uh, if they aren't, you're just wasting your energy, like <laughs> overthinking, you know, nine thousand different situations and i think a lot of that comes from centering yourself right um it's very very easy to complain when you put yourself on a pedestal um it's very easy to complain when you compare right like um i don't know when we're born no one stamps on our hand that life's gonna be fair like 
you know, there's kids who are born literally fresh out of the womb and are already at a disadvantage, you know, and they're, they come in the world fighting for their lives. And so I do find it intriguing. You know, we hit a point at like 14 and we're like, why, why isn't this fair? And it's like <laughs> kind of funny <laughs> to me um, that we go through that. And it makes sense that we go through that. But at the same point, um, when you're complaining, um, when you are getting like overly frustrated, um, a lot of that is um, coming from you just thinking about me, right? And um, me is important, but it's not everything. <laughs> and I think that once you can like settle in and understand that everyone has a job and that uh, not everyone is going to see the world the way that you do and that just because people don't do nice things doesn't mean that they aren't nice people and just because people are nice people doesn't mean that they're always going to do nice things. Like, I think that growing and understanding that it comes over time. I don't expect any 16, 18, 20 year olds to be where I'm at mentally because I got here through pain, uh, joy and failure. Right. And so I, how am I supposed to ask a 23-year-old who's had a different path to be where I am, right? And so I think understanding that uh, will help you to understand the people a lot better in general. Did you always feel that way, though? Or was has this been like a development for you? Like in, in like what kind of, or, you know, is, have you always kind of had this perspective or is was there something that, made you think I need to reframe how things are? Uh, I've always kind of been like this. Um, I've, mm, I've had more clarity, like over the last three or four years. Um, but yeah, I would say that my personality was like this, like this laid back sort of, um, what's, <laughs> let's talk about it. And, uh, and I can totally see how that like rubs people the wrong way. Um, and I was also like, I am the type of person, like you can talk to me about something, but if you don't give me a good enough explanation, like I'm probably not gonna change what I'm doing, All right? Or if it doesn't resonate with me, like I probably won't follow that path. And so um, for me, I guess understanding that I made that choice, right? Is, yeah, I guess like I've always had this choice made. Um, and that was where a lot of the frustration came from was like, why can't I have my cake and eat it? Um, why can't I be the way that I am and play in the NHL? But it's not my right. Um, no one has the right to play in the NHL. It's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful opportunity that many people work towards. Um, I felt that, and <laughs> it's been written that I have the skill and I've played there and I performed there and I hadn't played in the NHL in three years and I had four points in three games in preseason. <laughs> like, you know, my ability is, is always been there. Um, it's just, they're not a hundred percent sure about me in the locker room or like what I'll say to the media <laughs> or like, if I don't agree with the coach, like how I'll respond. And those things are fair. Right. Um, I can't ask them to be courageous. I can't ask them to be gentle. That's not their job. And understanding that, understanding the environments that we're in that are safe and the environments that we're in that um, have expectation will allow you to navigate things a lot better. 
Um, but like I said, like that comes from growth. Like all of a sudden, like this flip switch from I was 15 and 16 and my coach is like, how can we help you get better? And then 17, 18, like they're like, how can we help you get better? And then you turn pro and it's like, why aren't you better? <laughs> and, and like that, like that's like tough. And it feels like they've made a lot of good changes in the direction to try to help kids. And I think that all these stories about these guys who are like destroyed mentally post-career, these athletes who still have depression, even though they played in the NHL for, you know, 15 years because their self-talk is so atrocious because of how like they used to speak to us. Right. It, it's all coming together and things are getting better and, um, there's lots and lots of hope, like for the future of sports and the hockey community and mental health, because I feel like now as a society, um, we're acknowledging a lot of things. But for me, one thing that I never was going to let happen was to use mental health as a crutch. Like for me, when I was going through all this stuff, I didn't, I didn't talk to, about it publicly because that wasn't the only reason why I wasn't where I wanted to be, right? And I didn't want that to be the fixation as, oh, Josh was struggling, so he didn't make it. That wasn't the case. I was struggling <laughs> and I made some choices, right? There's uh okay, I want to get back to the music, but there was one thing there that kind of struck me that you were talking about coaches, GMs, whoever, maybe ha having reservations about bringing you into the team, whether because of what you might say in the media or how you how you conduct yourself or whatever that may be. And you said that that's fair, and I just wanted to understand why you think that that criticism is fair because I from from the outside looking in I've always felt like the criticism you received is was largely unfounded and kind of kind of brought about out of a a, a culture within the sport that is not always accepting of other perspectives the two things that that come to mind are when you missed a team meeting in training camp and then when you wore in 66 when you came up and that really rubbed people the wrong way. And I never quite understood that. And I'm just curious to hear your thoughts on why you thought that maybe people not wanting to bring you into a team was, was founded. Cause I never, I never really thought that it was, I thought that maybe, you know, we have someone here who is not perfectly fitting the mold of a, of a hockey player, but why can't we accept different perspectives? So I'm, just, I'm curious about your perspective on that. Mm, the reason why I say it's fair is back to my original point. If it's not my right to play in the NHL. Like, nowhere when I was born did it say, Josh, I was saying, like, you're playing the NHL for 15 years. So that's why I say it's fair. It's not my choice. I make my choices on my day to day. They make theirs. Do I think that I could have helped teams that, uh, in organizations that I was with in the past? Absolutely. Um, those organizations didn't win the Stanley Cup, but they had success in their own form, right? Um, to say that they were to have more or less with me, I'm not a fortune teller. <laughs> like, I can't, I can't. Um, a hundred percent say that. Do I believe that they would have? Yes. <laughs> uh, but for me, um, hmm. like it takes time. So, like you said, like there was this culture, right? That was like kind of built around this is what hockey player is, or like a, in the dressing room, like this is how guys act. Like guys drink and they don't, you know right music <laughs> guys uh, are quiet and they say, Oh, we just got to keep them with the puck in coming in hard and 
and they don't say, well, last week I read this quote. And <laughs> <you know? laughs> so I, I think that, you know, I'm aware of that. And um, like I said, that there's been like so much growth, like it's taken them since I was like, I guess 19, like I'm 28 now. So yeah, it's like nine years since like, I really like entered that stuff um, and was like really put on blast through the media. And I think that like, there's been so much growth through there that like, I'm not really mad. Like I see that other kids are getting better opportunities than I did. I see that they're being more gentle with the youth. I see that they're trying to offer these kids like space to, Grow. like you look at Chicago trying to protect Bedard like they're not giving Bedard the McDavid treatment where like this guy's just thrown to the wolves because like people recognize like after the fact like oh okay like this is like impactful and this is hard and um yeah I think that I, I guess like the reason why I say it's fair is because like when a baby's born you don't expect it to be able to walk right away and like that's my expectation with the NHL. It's like when I came forward and I was like, "Hey, can I paint my skates?" And um, you know, saying kind of my truth to the media and my thoughts, and people called me brash for you know putting in my <laughs> over three thousand hours into my craft and then saying yeah i can stick handle like <laughs> yeah i'm fast <laughs> like um you know i feel i felt like i earned the right to say some of that stuff but other people i guess considered me arrogant and to each is their own uh one thing that i've always found amusing is that people have always called me lazy um and they've called me um like not necessarily uh, not necessarily like inside the box uh but then they all marvel at my skill and my talent and it's like i wasn't like that didn't just happen they acted like it happened overnight uh people acted like i didn't put in hours and hours and hours of work to be able to have fun when I play hockey and to be able to cross over and stick handle the way that I do. And I think it's so arrogant on their part to make that assumption based on like what they think they see. Right. It's like, I'm with these people for three hours. That always confused me. Like being a pro athlete is like 24 seven and they judge you based on what they see in four hours. And it's like, judge me based on my performances and nothing else. Like, and um, I understand that there's other stuff that goes into it. And that was like my, that's why I say like, it's fair. Because yeah. I don't necessarily believe that I'm uh, 150% right. And I don't believe that they are either. And for me, all I can do is add my experience to the, I guess, the melting pot of hockey and see how they choose to move forward with athletes and to see how athletes choose to move forward. I think that's such a such an interesting point such an interesting perspective um you know you're, you're talking about this time and I'm, I'm sure it was a very emotional time for you a lot of like early on in your career um and and there's a lot of people who would use something like this and blame others and say well it's their fault i i wasn't able to do all these things and and so on but you you have a very fresh perspective on that and and uh i think looking at at how you've developed and how and that growth piece that you've been talking about how you've been able to grow over this time how would you say you it shifted your approach now as a business owner and as somebody as running this app and so on like how has it shifted your your view on on how to run a business and and what and what you want to do going forward um 
I think I'm still learning like through the business stuff, but I think through a lot of the developmental and the creation I offered a lot of freedom and I listened to my employees and I just tried to offer some of the things that I felt made my life like um, more conducive for creation. Um, and I give people space to show me who they are. Um, I think that there's a lot of wonderful people hiding behind structure. Um, and I'm much more interested in who they are than their ability to color within the stencil. Um, whether they are or not, that's their prerogative. But, um, yeah, uh, for me, um, I hired based on, like, um, feeling. Um, uh, a lot of it was through conversation and just seeing where people's heads are at. Um, a lot of the decisions that I made uh, seem to have paid dividends, like, so far. Um, and we'll see how things go. Uh, I don't think that there is a right or wrong way to teach, actually. Um, I, I do think we've gone a little too far left in terms of, like, I love some of the coaches that told me I was a piece of shit, <laughs> you know? And, yeah, like, it's, like, catch-22. Like, you got to be careful, like, the stuff does stay in our minds. Like I can, I can reiterate every time I've been yelled at, and I think that there's a place for it, and I think that it offers a sense of understanding. But I do think that, like, when we're getting berated and belittled, and you know, we're getting our dream like dangled in front of us, and there's a lot of competitiveness in the locker room and toxicity in the environment that like it's on them to like try to make a better space. Um, if they want to be successful. Right. So like you look at, uh, you look at AHL success and East coast success and, you know, two teams that have really risen above like over the last couple of years are Syracuse and then the Everblades and, like, you look at those two organizations that are connected to Tampa Bay and Florida, who are also doing really well. Like, you look at Boston, like, Providence does well every year. Like, it's, it's one of those things where there's some spaces that I do think understand it and I do think have a better model, right? And it just takes time for everyone to figure it out. Um, I, yeah. That's on, that's why I say it's fair because it's a. I don't want to place the same expectation that they placed upon me, which was to just know. Like, why don't you just know? It's like such a tough position to put someone in, and I feel like we all experience that. Like, you know, you get all of a sudden you're an adult, and it's like you don't know how to do your taxes, and you like feel embarrassed. You're like, no, I don't because I've never done that and no one taught me that in school. And it's like, you get to school, you get to university at 18, 19. And it's like, yeah, like my mom taught me how to do laundry, but do you think I was paying attention? Like, <laughs> you know, like stuff like that and like learning how to cook and burning shit and, you know, like embarrassing yourself in front of girls and your friends and like, that's all life. And I think that some of that gets lost. Um, Failure is like a beautiful thing because the harder you fail, the less likely you are to do it again. <laughs> well, that's the thing. It's, that's a powerful message too, because it's, it's okay to fail, right? Like it's one of those things where everybody sits there and thinks like, Oh, I can't make a mistake. I have to be perfect. And like, but it's okay. You know, it's yeah, that was not the end of, of the world. That was one of my hardest parts about turning pro is because like, if you think anyone who's watching me play hockey, if you think I play outrageous, you should see me practice. Cause like I'm trying crazy shit in practice. But like when I went to pro, all of a sudden they were like, stop that. And I was like, why? I was like, it's practice. 
<laughs> I was like, we're supposed to practice. And they're like, practice realistic stuff. And I'm like, well, it could be realistic if you let me practice it. <laughs> you know? So like, I think that like, these are pro things though. Like I'm sure athletes will hear that and like just nod and die laughing, but it's true. Like, and so, and then they're like, after two years, they're like, oh, this guy is, you know, he seems like he lost his creativity. And I'm like, yeah, because it got structured right out of him. Like, it's, um, it's, it's really intriguing to me, some of the setups, right? But I remember, like, yeah, I, I've just, I've seen a lot of change. I guess that's part of the reason why, like, I don't feel the need to, um bash hockey or anyone because like i see trying in every environment that i played in and i see trying in the nhl and i see trying by the podcasts that are all talking about hockey and i see the trying by the players and so for me um that's one thing that i've always found i guess interesting about the media is like we'll be trying to make like a societal change but there's so much negativity around it as well right and so like hockey's trying to make a change like yeah like why why am i gonna bash why am i gonna bash anyone um so all of this said wh where are you at now with your hockey career you know you are you're out for a while back now with florida do you are you just having fun? Are you hoping to kind of earn your way back to the NHL? Where are you at with things? No, I'm just having fun, man. I'm just having fun. I I'm gonna treat this like my men's league. You know, if they call me and they want me to go play in the NHL, sure, I'll be there. You know what time? <laughs> Send me a text. <laughs> like I, yeah, I came here to help Florida win. They sent me a text. <laughs> <laughs> and so I came over like it's that simple like um I'm much more focused on good people than good money so anyone who listens to this if you're trying to get a hold of me or you want me to play with you I, I hope you got some good people in your environment um yeah I just um uh, I really think that you never know part of the reason why i don't why i didn't come back with the nhl mentality is back to the conversation about my hand where i don't know when this is gonna get taken away from me anymore i was arrogant to think that like at 18 like i was gonna play for 10 years like like actually like so arrogant because i was you know one one knee one slip like away from maybe not being able to play or not even be able to play the way that i love to play and so like i just want to enjoy being able to play hockey the way i love to play what i can and if people see that i offer value to a team or an organization the way that i've always seen uh through myself then um cool and if they don't then that's cool too <laughs> Kind of feels like you took the power back a little bit. You went from, well, I don't, if I'm not going to fit into your structure, I'm going to play on my terms. I think I just made the conscious choice that I had no interest in fitting in that structure. I I thought that it was structured poorly. And to be honest, like at the time, the NHL, I still think out of the four major leagues, it's the least profitable, like, I still think that there needs to be a lot of changes, right? Hockey is like one of the craziest games in the world. Like you're skating on water, right? Ice, like on these metal blades with like a stick in your hand. It's high pace. There's fighting. There's passion. There's good, good, like human beings in every locker room who do so much for their community. And it's just like no one knows. And so like for me, yeah. I think that um, the NHL has some work to do in terms of highlighting the phenomenal people that are involved from the staff all the way to the players. Um, but in terms of like gameplay and 
how everything's going with that. I mean, that's up to the coaches and the GMs. Um, personally, I think that um, every team that doesn't make the playoffs and then comes back with like <laughs> the same core 13, like they're, they're, uh, they're asking for trouble. You know, I think that hockey is not competitive enough, like in terms of, uh, I think some guys get locked into jobs on those five-year contracts because it's guaranteed money. And when they figure that out, the NHL will get even better. But um, I do think that they're trying, and it's a process, like I said. Do I think the next one, Alex? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, uh, you're back to playing now in the ECHL after about a year away. Is there anything you do as part of your routine to prepare mentally? Like for anybody who might be listening, you know, what kind of things does Josh Hosang do on a daily basis to get re- to get in like the right headspace to prep? Like, how do you how do you approach that? Mm. So I wake up around. You know, he's gonna love this my old agent, Ian Palzer. He's the one who told me about this, actually. Um, so I wake up anywhere between 6 and 2. <laughs> like, wide range, wide range. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I, I let my body sleep. I try to wake up naturally. Um, don't worry, I do have an alarm clock. <laughs> <laughs> But, uh, yeah, I, uh, first thing I do, um, I drink a bottle of water, uh, cause a lot of people like look at their phones first thing in the morning. And if you're going to do that, at least hydrate your brain and your eyeballs. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, your body's just, you wake up dehydrated regardless. It's eight hours without water. So just, uh, helping getting all the neurons in there and uh, muscles sort of firing. And then once I finish the bottle of water, um, I'll stretch um, probably for from anywhere between 30 minutes to uh, two hours. And then um, I'll usually jump into some work and then um kind of organize my day go to the rink see the boys <laughs> uh check in on everyone uh one thing that i actually took from russia that i love and i encourage uh, anyone who plays hockey sports honestly anything um when in russia when when we came into the rink it was like a tradition to go in and shake everyone's hand like every single person that's there like go in you shake their hand and i think it's like a really cool sentiment because it's like i see you right it's like you know we're here to work today i acknowledge that you're here you acknowledge that i'm here um and giving people that i guess like that recognition uh goes like a really long way and so yeah go in make sure i say hi to everyone all the staff hand out fist bumps like candy (laughs) and then uh for the most part we train and then i'll stretch again do some more work stretch again uh probably before bed um and then i would say like between probably like between three and ten like that's just depending on the day like some days we have games some days i'm working uh some days i'm playing video games some days i'm on the beach tough life i know (laughs) 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 yeah for me i strive to make this life you know like so i yeah i'm really proud of where i am um i i always find it funny when people are like you could have more you could be more and it's like yeah but i also could be present (laughs) (laughs) yeah 
No, good, good stuff. And um, I, I said I wanted to bring it back to music, but before I do, I just wanted to mention that the whole shaking the hand thing. I worked with a guy years ago who uh, was a, more of a senior leader within the organization, came in and did that every day with everyone. It was, it was a small group, um, but it was uh, within a basketball organization, and it was really – that stuck with me, and I always thought that that was awesome. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. I, and I – I wish I did more of that myself, but I, I I don't, but I should. It's and you know what? It's a cool way to get out of your comfort zone because, like you said, like it's not one you don't want to do it every day. Like there's some days where you walk in, you're so tired, you're like, oh my god, I gotta go say hi to like 30 people. Um, but seeing the reactions on their face gives you energy for your day, right? And um, them seeing your reaction gives them energy for their day. And I think it's like a really cool karmatic cycle that you create. Love it. Uh, we'll get out of here shortly, but but first I wanted to come back to the the, the role music plays in your life. Um, you said to the New York Post recently that there are songs that literally saved your life. When I read that, that's heavy. And I'm just, I take this where you want to go with it, but I'm just, want to hear about you know what music means to you you know what you know what some of these songs may be and how they've helped you overcome some of these darker times yeah so i guess like everyone has different experiences with mental health uh for me like i think a lot i got like um normally it's 20 fun things going on in my head uh like I'm thinking about art and music and a quote that I saw and what I'm going to do next with my business and how excited I am to play on Wednesday. Like all these things are kind of like flooding in my brain constantly and making sure that like I'm prepping and crossing T's and dotting I's, like all that stuff. Um, and so I have a great relationship with my subconscious right now. <laughs> um, and so like, just staying positive to that stuff is has been really cool but didn't always start there <laughs> um i kind of lost control i feel like every person explains it differently in terms of their experience but i just like lost control of my subconscious um it was like in my day-to-day -day, like i was fine for the most part but i felt sad like often and um and then like i would be like walking and i would see like a subway and i would be like what if i jumped what would happen would people be sad would i be sad but i know <laughs> um and i just started questioning death um and i never acted on suicidal thoughts i never had a suicidal fantasy um personally but um i did have that questioning and uh the moment that that started happening i was like whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> i love life like where is this coming from um and it scared me a lot um because i never had those thoughts you know and i wasn't sure if that was like trauma related or um if i was going crazy <laughs> um and so yeah i probably sat in silence for like two months and then i talked to my best friend patrick bedell and he um talked to me and he recommended that i go to therapy and i ignored him <laughs> and i kept talking to him like used him as my therapist i guess for a bit and then that summer i went back home and um i had a really hard year uh working through that um to the guys um special shout out to um burroughs uh watherspoon uh van de Sample, and uh stevie because through that time they didn't know that but I started going to their house for dinner because I feared to be alone. 
Um, and I acknowledged that I wasn't in a good place, like for myself. And so I tried to reach out to those around me. And those are teammates that it's my fault for not telling them. It's not their fault for not knowing. Um, and um, yeah, they just offered me like a safe space and I would be in their house, <laughs> not in a good way, but they would be able to make me laugh like every once in a while and um, help me get distracted. And so thank you so much to those guys who just like opened up their door to me when like for two years I had never really like <laughs> done anything like that. And they um, they really helped me out. Um, and then um, that summer, <laughs> I obviously knew I was in one. <laughs> and uh, I went to talk to Matt Nickel. Uh, I hadn't worked out at Matt Nickel's gym for like two years at that time. Um, and I talked to Maddie and I said, Maddie, <laughs> I love you and I'll listen to you. This is kind of what's going on. And Maddie said, I got uh, five different therapists that you can try and you can come back to the gym tomorrow. And I was like, <laughs> it was just, yeah. I remember I was, I was crying in the back of St. Mike's with Matt Nickel looking at a kid's park and he was helping put Humpty Dumpty back together again. Um, and yeah, for me, when the second person that I loved, like who I had a lot of love for, told me that I should go to therapy, that's my rule now. When two people I love tell me to do something, I give it a try. <laughs> uh, uh, and so, yeah, I, I did. And uh, it paid tremendous dividends. Uh, I love my therapist, Lana. <laughs> she is the best. Um, she has a very unique touch, um, in terms of how she listens. Um, so yeah, for me, that, that was kind of, I guess, the process through that mental health journey. And then, yeah, I would say in total, it was about a year and a half of like not really having control of my thoughts. Um, but, um, so this, I will say very lightly because everyone has their own battle. I personally chose to seek exercise, hydration, and diet before medication. And that fixed a uh, sleep schedule too. Uh, <laughs> and that fixed a lot talking through therapy twice a week as well um that was my answer it's about an action plan like with everyone involved and i was very 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 fortunate to have that and that's part of the reason why i offer my music and my app because those are spaces that um also guided me to um to to that space wow um i'll just say that I'm, I'm you know i'm so thankful that you found you know your way out and um and obviously leading us to have this conversation i, I feel very thankful to have, have met you josh and and it's uh this has been a great great chat and, uh, and I'm, I'm glad that you're on the other side of things and, and feeling good about where you're at um, and on that note, um, anything else that you want to add uh, before we wrap up? And obviously, let's uh, let's promote your where to find your album and, and where to find your app. Um, yeah, uh, no, just thank you guys for uh, focusing on the aspects that I guess sometimes get covered up by the glory and the beauty of um, sports and just life in general. Um, I think that you guys are um, 
tremendous individuals for for choosing this path uh and for for the thought and time that you put into into growing people's minds and and also spaces for for people to feel safe uh that's why i agreed to do this and <laughs> yeah no for me in terms of saying more um i guess yeah we covered a lot so is <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, thank right. you so much, and thank you for sharing your story and and doing all this. It's it's really it's impactful stuff, and to have uh, someone with a platform like yours to to speak openly about it, it's so valuable, and it's so valuable to the work that even we do, and I know a lot of my colleagues do across the country. So, uh, thank you. <laughs> no worries, guys. Um, and then in terms of my album, you can find it on uh apple music spotify youtube whatever you like uh it's pretty much on everything if uh you can't find it somewhere just send me a message and i'll try to get it posted on that platform uh in terms of my app it's on it's in the google store and the apple store i uh, just type in pop sports and you uh you should be able to see it it's uh obviously going through uh, the growing pains of any app. So make sure that you uh, host events and uh, try to invite friends if you like the platform or you like the concept. Because um, I do think it's important to grow that space in society, but we need to do it together. <laughs> um, and I guess, uh, yeah, I guess that's everything really. Thank you guys for your time. Thank you for listening to the Talk Today podcast. To learn more about our work through the Talk Today program, visit talktoday.ca. And to stay up to date on the podcast, don't forget to like and subscribe.